Hello, welcome to Sing for Hull, week 15, day 4. My name is Mr King, I'm one of the percussion teachers at the music service and I'm delighted to tell you that I am back in the Albemarle Music Centre for the first time for three months. And I'm going to introduce the instrument of the week this week which is tuned percussion. So come follow me and we're going to go into the percussion room. I've not been in here for three months so I'd like you to come and have a little tour around the percussion studio. So this is the percussion studio at the music service and I'm going to introduce this week these instruments, the xylophone, the glockenspiel, the marimba and the vibraphone. I'm also going to be taking you downstairs into the main hall to show you the timpani drums. The fact of the day, second only to human voice, Percussion instruments are believed to be the very first musical instruments ever created, dating back as far as 6000 BC. People used percussion instruments to communicate and send signals across long distances. The first instrument I want to introduce to you today is the xylophone. The origins of the xylophone lie in the far distant past and are difficult to trace. The first evidence of the instrument is found in the 9th century Southeast Asia. It is probable that the xylophone arrived in Europe during the Crusades. In 1511, the German organist Arnold Schlick mentions it in his work Spiegel der Orgelmacher und Organistin, calling it Holster Glechter which means wooden laughter. It was not until the 19th century that the xylophone was discovered as an orchestra instrument. The French composer Camille Sanson was one of the first to use the xylophone in his orchestral pieces Dance Macabre and The Carnival of the Animals. Here is the xylophone part for Dance Macabre. And now he used the same notes in the Carnival of the Animals for his work The Fossils, which is a segment of the Carnival of the Animals, which depicts the skeletons, bones knocking together. The instrument looks very much like a keyboard or a piano, set up in exactly the same way with the bottom row of notes and the top row of sharps and flats. The notes on the xylophone are made from wood. Originally, there were no resonators on xylophones, but as time went on, resonators were introduced. These are the big tubes underneath. And these hold the air which vibrates inside the tubes. So, hence giving the resonator sound. This makes the sound much louder. Which helps the note to vibrate inside the tube. The next instrument I'd like to introduce is the marimba. The origin of the marimba is uncertain. Some believe that it originated in Southeast Asia in the 14th century and others think that it came from Africa. The instrument was brought to South America in the early, early 16th century. It is very similar to the xylophone. As you can see, it uses wooden bars. These also made from rosewood. And it also has resonators underneath. But just look at the difference of these resonators underneath. These resonators are huge and they weigh an absolute ton. Very difficult to carry. These resonators produce much, much deeper sounds. As, as the resonators are bigger, the sound goes lower. I'll just play the very bottom note of this marimba. 
And then as you go all the way up, you can see that the resonators get smaller and smaller. And I will play the very top note. On the xylophone, it is three and a half octaves. Now an octave is when you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight notes. That is one octave on the marimba. So let's see how many octaves this marimba has. There's another, that's the first octave. There's another octave here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Another one here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Another one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one more, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means we have five octaves on this marimba. Very, very large instrument. It is known around the world that you can go up to six and a half octaves, and sometimes in different countries they can play them with lots and lots of people all playing the same instrument. On this instrument, I can use two mallets, which are very different to the xylophone. They're used with felt or wool beaters. Um, I can also use four mallets. So I'm going to show you how to use four mallets on the marimba. <laughs> Next we have the glockenspiel. This is the instrument that you'll probably recognise the most because it's in probably every school in Hull. Um, this particular one is a proper full-size orchestral glockenspiel. The glockenspiel was originally a fusion of two different types of instruments. The genuine glockenspiel, which had real bells, and the metallophone. Metallophones were first mentioned in Europe in the middle of the 18th century. The first composer to write for the glockenspiel in the orchestra was George Friedrich Handel, who included it in his oratorio, Saul, in 1739. The Dutch idea of replacing sophisticated bells with simple bars was widely adopted in the first half of the 19th century. The result was the first keyboard glockenspiel. Shortly afterwards, the mallet instrument was developed to improve the tone, the bars of this instrument being struck by handheld mallet or beaters. The two mallets that I have here, the plastic one, which is the black one, and the other one, which is made from brass, they make slightly different tones. So this is the tone with the plastic beater. And then with the brass metal beater. From the mid-19th century, both types were found, the keyboard and the mallet in the orchestra. But the 20th century composers increasingly preferred the mallet instrument because of its superior tone. You might recognise this piece of music. It's very, very popular and it was written for the glockenspiel. Now we move on to 
the larger of the metal barred instruments called the vibraphone. The vibraphone has these tuned metal bars made of aluminium. Very, very similar to the glockenspiel, but as you can see, much bigger and more like the size of the xylophone. There are resonators on this instrument as well, as you can see. So we've talked about the resonators and how they work. And that allows the note on the vibraphone to be sustained. And that means it's going to go for a very long time. I'm helping it to keep resonating by using this pedal at the bottom with my right foot. If I press the pedal down, you can see how it moves this bar with felt on up and down. If I leave my foot off the pedal, the felt is touching the bars and then I can play much shorter notes. So by pressing the pedal down, I can allow the bar to resonate for longer. That's how the vibraphone works. The vibraphone was given its name because of these fans that are moving. As you can see, I'm making the move here with my fingers. Now, normally they will move by use of electrically operated motor here, which doesn't work on this vibraphone at the moment, but I can show you how the vibraphone got its name by playing it and moving these fans around. So this is the note without the fans moving. And then with the fans moving. The vibraphone was invented in about 1920 and was soon common in dance bands and became a prominent jazz instrument. The first time the vibraphone was used in the orchestra was in Alban Bagg's opera Lulu in 1937. So now on the vibraphone I'm going to play a little jazz-like number. Um, this is the gallery theme from Vision On, which is a programme many years ago that used to have a gallery and show pictures that people used to send in. And then it was later used by Tony Hart in Take Heart. Uh, we're going to take you on a little gallery tour now of the percussion studio. So we brought you downstairs and I'm going to introduce the timpani drums to you now and we are in the main hall of the Albemarle Music Centre and as you can see it's very empty at the moment but we hope that in the near future we'll be seeing it full of musicians again playing and practicing their music. So onto the timpani drums. We have four timpani drums and they have a different pitch set on each one of them. It could take up to about one to two years to build a full set of timpani drums and each one weighs about 140 pounds so if you add up 
all the weight of this, that probably adds up to the weight of S Club 7. A single timpani um, can be changing its own pitch with the use of a pedal. In the old days, before timpanis had pedals, they were controlled by a chain and a crank. So we're very fortunate nowadays to have these big pedals at the bottom. When I strike the drum with a big felt beater on top, it produces a long, low, deep sound. And as I press the pedal, I can change the pitch of that note to make the note go higher because the skin on top is being tightened by this rim. And as you can see, the pedal moving tightening the skin, making the pitch higher. Each drum gets higher in pitch because this is the largest moving around to the smallest. And as it gets higher, the drum is smaller at the top. So these are the timpani drums, and I'm now going to perform for you a piece of music by John Beck, the second movement of his sonata and this has a little jazz-like feel to it, so enjoy. Thank you for watching Sing for Whole Week 15, Day 4, and the Instrument of the Week. Um, don't forget to tune in tomorrow uh, to sing along with the song Reach in our Week 15, which sadly is our final week on the first series of Sing for Whole, but uh, we hope to be back with you again in the autumn, uh, doing once a month, again, Sing for Whole. So please look out for that, and uh, please visit our website for any resources to follow up over the summer. Um, we thank you for watching and keep singing and keep making music. Thank you very much. Bye for now.